All right, you can go ahead and open your Bible. It would probably help if you could see, huh? So we'll wait on that. I'm grateful I was able to find this flashlight. Otherwise, we'd all be in the dark. Actually, we kind of are in the dark, but that's all for purpose for the, for the time being. I want to continue on with our brief three-week series. We're going to wrap that up this morning. We've been talking about our missional priorities as a church. To love, to learn, to live, to lead. And a number of years ago when church leadership kind of took the uh, mission statement that we had and tried to simplify that and make it memorable because we believe it's incredibly important that each and every one of us understands the discipleship process. And it starts with that foundation of loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. A couple weeks ago we had a chance to hear from uh, Peter and Anita uh, Contola and and they began to unpack just a little bit how they are seeking to implement that missional priority in their own lives and with their family. Then last week, we actually skipped over the learn portion because we heard from those that were a part of our Camp Nathaniel mission trip. And they talked about, really, in, in essence, the living and the leading portion of that mission statement. It was an an on-the-job opportunity to live out faith and to lead by example. And so this morning we're circling back to the principle of learning and how important that is and how it affects these other areas as well. And so that was something that my parents highlighted in our home as well growing up. The importance of learning together as a family. And, and spiritual truths. I remember on the middle of our kitchen table, my parents had a little plastic box. Maybe some of you uh, had a, a something similar. And inside that little plastic box were these little cards that all contained verses, scripture verses. And so we would try to memorize those as a family. And I remember the first one my brother memorized was uh, Psalm 34, verse 13, which says, Keep thy tongue from evil hated that verse because I was the one who oftentimes did the opposite of that. And the first thing out of Jeff's mouth would be, keep thy tongue from evil. And he'd kind of reprimand me. And I wish at that point I'd have known that other verse, judge not lest you be judged. But I didn't know that one at the time. But I remember one of the other verses that was in that box that we memorized together as a family was Psalm 119, 105, which says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yeah. And that's what we want to highlight this morning. I want to invite you to open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm getting caught up here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so there's a couple verses here that when the church leadership team landed on this learn principle as one of the key missional priorities that that we believe God has called us to as a congregation these two verses were uh, a couple verses that really stood out and so we're going to kind of review these we've gone over these missional priorities in the past but we feel like it's important for us to kind of be reminded just what it is that we are about as a church family. So I want to begin reading in verse 14. Um, Our main focus is going to be on verses 16 and 17, but I want to give just a little bit of context, a little bit of background. Paul is writing this letter to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. And in the midst of this letter, his second letter to Timothy, he writes this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So as we kind of break down the first couple verses before we get to the main teaching point in verses 16 and 17, Paul begins by encouraging Timothy to continue 
in what you've learned and become convinced of. There's three key words there that I want to focus on. The first word is continue. The idea is that we need to stand firm, that we need to persevere, we need to endure. So continue, hang on to the truths that Paul says you have learned. You've understood them. You know them. And so abide in those truths. Paul goes on to tell Timothy that, that you were convinced of those things. In a sense, you have confirmed that they are the truth. You have made certain of the truth in which you believe. Okay? So we've got those three principles or three key words there found in verse 14 that we want to make sure we understand that we've got to continue in what we've learned, things that we've become convinced of. And then Paul goes on to tell Timothy, you know who it was that kind of established that foundation. Verse 14, he says, you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy... You have known the Holy Scriptures. Infancy from just a small child. That those words and those truths were planted into Timothy's life. So Paul writes, you know from whom you've learned it. So who's, who is that? Who's Paul talking about? Well, if you turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and keep your finger there in, in chapter 3, we'll be back there. But in chapter 1, he actually unpacks for us just who it was that from infancy was involved in this process. Look at verse 5, 2 Timothy 1, 5. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, Paul saying this about Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. So Paul identifies that Timothy, the foundation in your life was laid by your grandmother and your mother. And what we see here really is just a beautiful model of how spiritual learning is supposed to work. Okay, the church really should just be a partner should support the work that's going on at home, but unfortunately, sometimes that's not the case. That parents, grandparents kind of shirk those responsibilities and just kind of hope the church will do the job that ultimately Scripture calls parents to do. Okay, we talked about that two weeks ago when we looked at the passage from Deuteronomy chapter 11 and from Deuteronomy chapter 6, that the responsibility ultimately in equipping our kids falls to the family, parents and grandparents. And that's how it was established in, Timothy, in Timothy's life. And Paul identifies that very fact. So I want to uh, challenge you today that if you're here, whether you are an adult or whether you are a child, and this is the only spiritual meal that you're depending on, you are going to be woefully malnourished spiritually woefully malnourished okay we've got to be in god's word on our own and so you as parents equipping your kids and spending time with your kids in the word of god and maybe even grandparents coming alongside because we see that was instrumental in timothy's development okay imagine if you were to go home today after church and you enjoy your nice Sunday dinner and that is the only meal that you have until next Sunday okay now unless you were fasting for spiritual purposes um, and even if you are fasting you're gonna be starving okay you're gonna be hungry and and probably you are gonna be physically weak and yet some of us some within the church not just Ravenna Baptist, but some within the church universal. That's how we operate. Trying to survive on one meal a week. That's, that's where I go to get recharged. Well, I hope that's true. But I hope you also get recharged in your own time in the Word of God. And that you as parents realize your responsibility in coming alongside your kids as well. And you're never too young to begin. Okay, we learn that uh, from, from Timothy, Paul, I, Paul says he learned it from infancy. 
Okay, that, that word has a, a, a range of, of meanings. Could be from you know, a baby to even a small child. But no matter what, he learned it at a very young age. So a couple of weeks ago, Lee came home from Awana and she was just bragging up uh, some of the great learning that was going on. And those of you that help in Awana, you realize that, yeah, you're helping there, but a lot of the work actually starts at home. Starts at home as parents or grandparents or maybe even older siblings are working with those kids to memorize those verses. And in first service, if, yeah, you should have been here for first service because I'm going to brag on one of our families, Zach and Rebecca Brooks. And uh, they haven't been uh, at church really just over the last few weeks is when they've come back just for COVID reasons. And, and, uh, and then with Awana as well. And their little daughter, Ayla, uh, two weeks ago at Awana, got up in front of all those kids. And she actually got, I got her up uh, here in front of first service. And she rattled off all the books of the New Testament. I mean, this, this girl's like this tall. And it was just amazing to see. Okay. But what happened? Just because Zach and Rebecca weren't at church and didn't have their kids at Awana didn't mean that they just kind of you know, stood back and said, well, you know, good luck to our kids spiritually. No, they realized that that was their responsibility. And so they continued to work with their kids through those Awana books so that when they walked back into the program a couple weeks ago, boom, Ayla could rattle off all those New Testament books. It was, it was a beautiful thing to see. So, great job, mom and dad. And I want to encourage all of us, parents, grandparents, that's our responsibility. Okay? And as a church, we want to stand beside you. We want to help equip you. And we want to be a part of that responsibility as well. That's why it's one of our missional priorities to learn. And so in all areas of ministry, we want to be in the Word of God, whether that be in our Awana program or our Sunday school, kids Sunday school, or in our adult Bible studies, or, or in our Sunday morning Sunday school classes, or here in this Sunday morning service. God's Word is a focus. God's Word is what we're committed to learn from. And why do we do it? Because God's Word is transformational. Okay? Now, one of the things that you know as well as I do, we will never have exhaustive knowledge of God or of God's Word. So there's always going to be room for us to uh, you can continue to grow. But we don't do it just to gain more knowledge. Okay? Paul writes that uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, which is why love is the foundation of all those missional priorities. Love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, we don't start with the knowledge because that can give us a big head. Look how much I know. Okay? But that's not ultimately what the accumulation of knowledge is for. Instead, it's about uh, helping even circle back to these other missional priorities. Because as, as I learn more about God, that affects how I live for God. It affects how I lead my family. And, and as God has called me to lead this church and, and to lead out into the community, for each of us, that should affect how we live and lead, but also circle back to as we learn more about God, we should love Him more dearly, and we should love others more fully. Okay. See how those principles all work together. So with that as a background, let's look at verses 16 and 17, because Paul identifies some truths about Scripture that are important for us to understand. He says, as all Scripture is God-breathed, at the beginning of verse 16, all scripture is God breathed. So the Greek word, two words actually that Paul uses are the words theonoustos, God and breath, or God and breathe. God breathed. So, so we often maybe term that as it's inspired by God. So is that like, like uh, you know, I'm a musician and I was inspired to, to write this, this great song? Or I'm an artist and I was inspired to paint this beautiful picture. Is that what that's about? No. This inspiration is much different than that. Biblical inspiration is the supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit on the writers of the Word of God. Where the Holy Spirit really, uh, yes, inspired them to actually write the very words of God in their own style, 
in their own creative way, but to write the very words of God. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter uh, unpacks this just a little bit more. He says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Okay, so what's written here never had its origin in what the men who wrote this book, uh, what they decided needed to go in there. But the next part of uh, 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says this, But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowered them, inspired them to write the very words of God. Now, uh, look at the first two words of verse 16. Paul says, all Scripture. All Scripture. The totality, every passage of Scripture is God-breathed. All 66 books. The 39 Old Testament books. The 27 New Testament books. That little Aled quoted for us in first service. All of those Verses is God breathed. This incredible book that was written over a 1600 year time period by 40 different authors from uh, individuals from all walks of life, kings and philosophers and statesmen and prophets and priests and scholars and tax collectors and farmers and fishermen. We're all inspired by God to write what they did. And so what we learn is not just, you know, a collection of some great wisdom or insights. What we learn is God's very words. It's trustworthy. Those 40 authors on over 4,000 occasions actually claim to be writing God's word. 4,000 times. It's trustworthy. You can have confidence in it. So then Paul goes on to say all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful. It's the second thing that we need to understand as learners. And as we understand this second principle of our missional priorities, Scripture is useful. Just like milk nourishes an infant in ways that that infant couldn't even begin to understand, God's Word does the same thing in our lives. It nourishes us in ways we can't even comprehend. And so, how is it useful? Paul gives us four ways. Okay, verse 16. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So let's talk just a little bit about those four terms. It's useful for teaching. That means it involves instruction of the Word of God on doctrinal issues, yes, but also on areas of Christian and moral conduct. It's not just for the accumulation of knowledge, we talked about that earlier, but it's for transformation, for life change. And so as we read the text, we consider the theological implications of an accurate interpretation, and then we make the moral appeal to the practical application. God's Word, yes, helps us to understand content and doctrine but it also is to lead to transformation. Second thing, it's useful for teaching, yes. It's also useful for rebuking. Your translation maybe says reproof. That is to convict of misbehavior or false doctrine. God's Word is useful to convict us of misbehavior or false doctrine. So sometimes we need that slap on the wrist, if you will, to, to receive that rebuke. It confronts our disobedience. Now, undoubtedly, if you are a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you know that that's probably happened to you. Whether it's on a Sunday morning, uh, in a Bible study, in a Sunday school class, or maybe your own time in the Word of God and you read something and you're like, whew, the way I've been acting is kind of out of line. The way I've been responding or the way I've been speaking is kind of out of line. That's the rebuke. There are times when I've heard, you know, been listening to a podcast or heard someone teaching the word and I felt like they were talking directly to me. As a staff, I've told you, um, you know, that we read a lot of books together. And one of the books that we've been reading um, here recently 
has really hit me hard in some areas. And I've mentioned to Lee several times, like, wow, like I needed this at this time because the way I was responding, the way I was reacting, the way I was, uh, you know, my attitude was. And this book, in a sense, has kind of stepped on my own toes. And some of you all have told me that, like, hey, I feel like you were talking directly to me in the midst of that message. Like, you were looking right at me when you said this. Like, like you knew I needed this. Nope, that's not me. That's not me. You must have been listening outside our window yesterday. Nope. Nope, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God in the book of Hebrews says that uh, it's living and active. And so God brings application to your personal situation as you need it. Maybe it's for teaching. Maybe it's for rebuking. Or maybe it's for this third way, correcting in righteousness. Correcting. Scripture is useful for correcting. Now, for some of us, we can kind of maybe, you know, block out some of those things, uh, you know, for a while. Like, I'm not going to let it bother my conscience any longer. But a lot of times when that happens, guess what? We close our Bible. We stop coming to church. We're like, you know, kind of pretend like, no, I don't need to hear what's there. Okay? And we're kind of set in our own ways. But when you're living in sin or living in disobedience, one of the first things you're going to be tempted to do is to skip your time in the Word or to pull away from the church and the very people that God has called us to uh, be in relationship with. You won't have peace until you take that rebuke to heart, take that correction to heart. So correction, let's talk about that word. Okay? While God's word is there to give us a rebuke when necessary, to show us when we're wrong, it also is there to lovingly and graciously guide us back onto the right path. That's the idea of correction. Guide us back to the loving arms of our Heavenly Father. So Scripture, yes, it teaches, it rebukes, but it also builds us up. Helps us grow in godly behavior. Now the Greek word for correction used there means the restoration of something to its original and proper condition. The restoration of something to its original and proper condition. It speaks of setting something upright that has fallen. Or helping that person get back on their feet after stumbling. You know, so as I thought about that, the Greek uh, translation of that word, there was a song by a uh, music group from a lot of years ago, uh, DC Talk. Okay? Um, some of you maybe are familiar with that. They started off as a rap group and uh, then kind of transitioned a little bit. And now they're kind of all doing their own thing, uh, just a little bit. But there's an old song that they wrote called, What If I Stumble? That's really about this whole idea of correction. And I want you to listen to the opening monologue. It says this, The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. So that song begins with that. Like, like yeah, sometimes that's me. Like with my lips, I'm going to acknowledge Jesus, but then sometimes with my actions, I look like an atheist. And so then the chorus of that song says, what if I stumble? What if I fall? What if I lose my step and I make fools of us all? Will the love continue when my walk becomes a crawl? What if I stumble? What if I fall? And that's where that correction piece comes in where God says, I'm going to set you upright. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to reestablish you when you stumble and fall. And so then the conclusion of that song says, I hear you whispering my name. And then Jesus says, my love for you will never change. You are my comfort and my God. So yes, teaching. Yes, rebuking we, when we need our, our toes stepped on. But also not just leaving us, you know, feeling horrible about ourselves, but picking us back up 
and giving us uh, that, that corrective word that we need. And then finally, training in righteousness. Look at it again in verse 16. All scriptures, God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The positive guidance that we need to continue to mature in our faith. That's training in righteousness. That God's word will continue to build and equip us to place us in that right standing before God. The truths found in God's word work. Okay? What you see here isn't true because it works. Okay? It works because it's true. Okay? Let me repeat that. What's in the word of God isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. Now, some of you, a number of years ago, probably saw the movie when it came out in the theater, Case for Christ, and uh, it, it tells the story of an atheist, or a former atheist, a man by the name of Lee Strobel. And he was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune, and his wife became a Christian, became a follower of Jesus. And so he, as this investigative journalist, said, I'm going to set out to prove to my wife and to everybody else that this whole Christianity thing is a hoax. And so for two years, he sought to do that. To prove that it was all just, you know, a bunch of fanciful stories. And ultimately, after two years, instead of disproving Christianity, Strobel ended up giving his life to Christ and placing his faith and trust in Jesus. And one of the things in the book by the same name that he unpacks a little bit more of his story one of the things that he said he did in the midst of this two-year journey was he began applying some of the biblical principles from God's Word. He didn't even believe it yet, but let me see if this actually works, and guess what? Because it's truth, it worked. And all of a sudden, he began applying uh, financial principles from the Word of God, and his finances improved. He began applying uh, biblical principles about marriage, and his marriage improved. He began applying biblical principles about relationships, and his relationship with his coworkers and his boss improved. Why? Because this is truth, and it works, because it is true. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed, is useful for one way or the other, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. All right, let's press forward to our third principle this morning from verse 17. Why is it good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness? So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture equips. Scripture equips equips now the new american standard says this that the man of god may be adequate may be equipped for every good work adequate somebody who's complete who's capable who's proficient at all that god might call us to do the niv that i teach from says thoroughly equipped to fit completely to make us competent to make us capable the phrase carries with it, since it says thoroughly equipped, that we, in a sense, are super equipped for whatever God might call us to do. And so sometimes we give that pushback when maybe you know, we feel prompted to do something, and you're like, oh, God, I could never do that. God says, I have super equipped you to do that. Don't tell me you can't. You have been thoroughly equipped for whatever God might call you to accomplish. And that's what our L2 mission is all about. Learning Scripture equips us to live more effectively for God. Equips us to lead more effectively for God's kingdom. And then circles all the way back around and equips us to love God more fully and love others more dearly. That's being equipped for every good work. Complete, capable, proficient. And if we are learners and students of the Word of God, letting the Word of God transform us, then it makes us fit for whatever God might call us to do. Now, 
probably some of you in the past maybe have tried to do something that you weren't physically fit to accomplish. Okay? So maybe some of you that are, you know, maybe more, uh, you know, athletically inclined and you, uh, you know, hit the gym or hit the weight room and uh, you think, all right, I'm going to try, I'm going to try 300 today on the bench press. Okay? And you've never benched more than 250. Okay? You're not going to be thoroughly equipped to push that up. And you're going to get it down here and you're going to say, hey, can somebody help me? Okay? You're not equipped to press that back out. For me, that happened a number of years ago as a runner and I was training to be, um, training for a, a marathon. And uh, a bunch of years ago, all right? A bunch of years ago, all right? <laughs> That's not anything recent, let me uh, assure you of that. And had it in my mind that that's, you know, the goal that I, uh, you know, was shooting for. And so, you know, I was running regularly, consistently, and increasing that mileage, but still not completely confident I'm going to be able to do this. So about, I don't know, four or six weeks before that marathon, I thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to try and do 24 miles. Because I thought, if I can do 24 miles... Come race day, I'll be able to gut out another 2.2, even if i got to crawl on my hands and knees, you know. And so, got up early on a Saturday morning and uh, got out on this gravel road um, and set out a couple water bottles. Um, and then at the halfway point, set out a few snacks and some fruit. And uh, here we go. I'm going to try and do 24 miles. And got to the halfway point, everything's going great, and got to probably 16, 18 miles in, all of a sudden my legs started tightening up a little bit. So I'm going to stop and just, you know, stretch. And uh, stre re-stretched a little bit and then started running again. And all of a sudden I got this horrible pain on the outside of my left knee. And I'm like, ugh. So I walked for a little bit, you know, re-stretch, I'm going to keep going, you know, try and run again. Same horrible pain. And... I had to walk the rest of that 24 miles. And ultimately what I realized and found out later from my doctor, it was an IT band uh, injury, which occurs either from overuse or from kind of ramping up your mileage too quickly and you weren't physically fit or prepared to actually run that far. That was me. Sometimes if we're not learning and in God's word as we should be, then we're not going to be equipped for what God calls us to. Okay. So I was joking with Keith this morning that uh, you know he was going to be on for sermon number two, but uh, I was so, so incredibly pleased with um, just his willingness and, and commitment. Like, I'm not up, you know, comfortable up in front of people, and yet to allow God to stretch him in that. Like, he could have said, nope, nope, I'm not going to do that. And yet, God, in the way God does, equips us to things when he calls us. Okay? If he's going to call you to something, he's going to equip you. And, and as we spend time in God's word, we will be even more thoroughly equipped. And so that's why learning is such a crucial part of our missional priorities. Okay? Because it's about our lives being transformed. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's got some things He wants you to accomplish. And some of that will take place as you allow yourself to be thoroughly equipped from the Word of God. So just as we did last week, we had all our mission team share. The week before, Peter and Anita shared just a little bit on some of the, how they're implementing that, uh, that first priority to love God and love others. I've invited uh, somebody to uh, share this morning, Larry Brines, and, and I want to invite Larry forward. He and his wife Lynn have just been a part of our church for about nine months is all. And even in those nine months, like I have seen that this is a guy that loves the Word of God, and um, has made learning from the Word of God a priority in his life. And so I asked Larry just to, uh, to share a few minutes, and like I told First Service, uh, he's one of those guys that I'm always a little nervous handing a microphone off to, because Larry likes to talk, 
Um, but um, yeah, what he shared this morning uh, in first service uh, was really powerful in this whole principle of learning. So I'm going to turn the microphone over no again. I first want to tell you that I am not involved in any way in the education community. I am not a teacher. I am not trained in any of that. As a matter of fact, my education started in 1959 in a one-room schoolhouse that my father had gone to. I graduated from high school in 1972, the very first class from Allendale Public High School. 52 students, and you don't need to know which number I was. <laughs> when, when did you start learning? What was the first thing you learned? How to hold a bottle? How to use a spoon or how to use the bathroom. I drive a couple days a week for my company from Ada to Muskegon to Holland to Middleville. A lot of people have learned how to drive with two elbows holding their telephone. I hope it's not you. Um, when do you stop learning? When do you quit? In thinking about this, I read some studies. When you're five years old, you do 98 creative tasks every day, and you ask 105 questions every day. People with little kids know it's probably closer to 500. When you get to be 45 years old, you are now asking six questions a day and doing two creative tasks from 105 to six. The study didn't say it, but when you get to be in your 60s, you only ask one question. Is there a bathroom here? <laughs> a number of years ago, maybe more than 25, I saw an interview that changed my life, changed the way I think. Billy Graham was being interviewed, and the man doing the interviewing said, now I know you're going to give God the credit for your success, but..." Billy, what's one tangible thing that you did that really changed your life? Billy was quiet for a minute. He said, you know, I'd have to say it was Proverbs. And the interviewer looked puzzled. He said, I've read a chapter of Proverbs every day as long as I can remember. I've read it from the front to the back, from the back to the front, in every version I can find. He said, when I'm gone on the road, my wife Ruth and I read it over the phone to each other. He said, there's no coincidence that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. So I got a little challenge. Maybe we could try that. Maybe you could try that. I've got some verses from Proverbs I'd like to read you. Above all, and these are from the message, above all and before all, do this. Get wisdom. Write it at the top of your list. Get understanding. Wisdom is better than all the trappings of wealth. Nothing you could wish for holds a candle to wisdom. Make hay while the sun shines. That's smart. Go fishing during harvest. That's stupid. <laughs> God's blessings make your life rich. Nothing we do can improve on God. A life devoted to things is a dead life, a stump. A God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. Some of them were about anger, which is something I've struggled with. Slowness to anger makes for deep understanding. A quick-tempered person stockpiles stupid. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Do your best. Prepare for the worst. And allow God to bring victory. Give yourself to disciplined instructions. Open your ears to tested knowledge. This wisdom is not going to come to you like big chunks of rock down a conveyor belt. It's going to come in little pieces. And you have to make the effort. I want to close with a couple of verses from 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given, what you've learned. Complementing your basic faith with good character. 
spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and genuine love. Each dimension is fitting into each other and developing the others. Thanks, Larry. So I don't think it's any coincidence at all that Larry shared those verses from 2 Peter, because the verse that God was giving me to conclude our service with was 2 Peter 1.3, which tells us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And then it goes into all those qualities that Larry just shared. Everything that we need to be equipped most fully comes from God. To live this life effectively comes from God and His Word. So let's be students of God's Word together. Isaac's going to come with one final song. Pray with me as we close. Father, uh, thank you uh, for this time today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, even just these three weeks that we've uh, rehashed the, uh, the, the priorities that you've called us to as a church. Lord, I thank you for the many people. We've obviously identified just a handful of people that are living these principles out, but there are many. And I am grateful for that, that, that there are so many part of the, the kingdom of God and, and this small representative of your church here in Ravana that are practicing these principles of loving you and loving others, of learning being students of the Word of God and applying those truths to our lives to, to help us to ultimately live more effectively for your kingdom and to lead more effectively uh, for your kingdom. So continue, Father, to uh, equip us. Continue to give us a passion for your Word. Lord, maybe there's somebody out here today who realizes that uh, they've maybe been trapped by sin. And they're the ones that kind of are sticking their fingers in their ear because they don't want that correction right now or that rebuke. God, I pray that today you would give them a renewed thirst for your word. Or the psalmist wrote that as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, oh God. God, just give us that passion for being in your word. And Lord, maybe it's, yeah, starting out just by reading that proverb of the day. So for today, God, maybe that's Proverbs chapter 14. And tomorrow, Proverbs 15. As you continue to input your wisdom into our lives. We love you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.